Hashmap Megabytes. Welcome to another episode of Hashmap Megabytes. Today we are going to talk about creating users in Snowflake. So the first thing is to log into your Snowflake instance and create a new worksheet, a new tab here. Uh, I find that it's best to keep all your user creation in a single tab. Uh, it helps you keep track of things. People may find it difficult to organize all your worksheets uh, if you use one worksheet per user. And it's really easy when you need to add a new user to just copy and paste the last one, fill in the values, and uh, go from there. Uh, and then we need our SQL. So user creation in Snowflake can be done in two ways. You can either execute SQL, which is my preferred way, uh, or you can use the UI, which is a little less easy to automate. So we're not going to do that today, but it's pretty self-explanatory. So going into our code, um, it is just SQL to create these users. Um, breaking a little bit into kind of the, the anatomy of a create user uh, statement, let's grab this SQL and jump in here. So the first thing we do is we just call create user and then this keyword. This is going to be the object identifier for that user. It's the SQL name that references the user Peggy Olson. Um, it is not necessarily the name you use to log in, and it's not necessarily the name that has to be displayed. Uh, but if all you do is provide create user and maybe a password, and, and you don't provide these fields, then the username and the login name, um, they're going to be the same. So that's why there's a little confusion on that. I like to specify it, even if you did want to use uh, this as the same down here. But there's actually a good reason why you might not want to. Next is the password, which I think uh, makes a lot of sense to uh, most people. Set this to whatever you like. Um, hopefully something randomly generated. Uh, that's what I had there before, maybe a passphrase. But then go ahead and um, set this must change password to true. So then when your, your new user logs in for the first time, uh, they'll change their password. You no longer have to worry about managing this secret. Then we have our login name. I strongly recommend people use their uh, email addresses uh, for their user login names. This is the value that you use to log in when you actually open Snowflake. Uh, and there's two reasons for why I recommend the, the email. Uh, the first is that you, you don't want your users to have to memorize a new value. They already know their email address, so why make it harder for them? Uh, the second is that if you do end up using single sign-on in the future, uh, that will rely on your login name for all users having usually the email address of whatever your ID, uh, your identity provider is using to identify them. So if you're using Active Directory, people are identified by their email address, and this should be a word-for-word -word match if you want to integrate with that identity provider. Uh, so that's a simple thing to do up front. What you might ask is, why don't why don't I just make the whole user the email address? And you could do that. It just becomes kind of a pain. Uh, to always remember to use these double quotes because you'll have to do that thanks to the special characters in here. So to make it nice and clean, easy for SQL and easy for uh, single sign-on in the future, this is the split that I recommend. Uh, you can use whatever pattern you want up here. Just make sure it's consistent. That's really more important than whether it's first name, underscore last name, or if you use initials. Whatever you do, just make sure it's consistent. Uh, next, we have some uh, kind of readability values here. So I always put in the display name and the first and last name uh, for this user. Um, I don't bother with like middle name or anything like that. Uh, then you provide the email specifically here because this does not necessarily have to be the email. So go ahead and add that again. Uh, and then like I mentioned, make sure you set the password, uh, change to true, and then set a default role. Uh, I believe public is going to be default no matter what you do, but rarely do you just create a user and give them public access, right? Hopefully you don't have uh, too much ability to do anything on the public role. So this is a nice placeholder, but what you might want to do is have... Um, analyst, right? That's the that's the role for this person. Um, make sure, though, that you don't stop here. Uh, a really kind of tricky thing is just because you've made analyst the default role for this person doesn't mean they have access to use that role. So you'll you want to make sure that you grant uh, access to that directly to the user. And this is a good pattern. This is something that will uh, every time you want to add someone new, you just copy all this add new values, and um, you're good to go. But passwords, um, maybe they're a little limiting in uh, the security that they offer. They're also kind of a pain to manage and to rotate. So uh, not everyone likes to use passwords. So I'll go ahead and uh, jump back into our SQL, and let's look at an SSO user. It's going to look really similar. So I'll jump back here. And uh, again, we're going to use that same split of login name and uh, kind of the user name right here being different. Uh, add the information, but we don't add a password. And this is because you assume that you have SSO set up already. Uh, authentication will always be through that identity provider. 
uh, you will have no reason to have a password. It might actually be kind of confusing for someone to even have one. So by not providing one, you kind of remove the ability to log in with a password. You don't have to worry about managing that. Uh, so this is probably what I would consider the simplest and most common uh, user creation in the enterprise for anyone using SSO. Uh, and then going back here, we have a more complex example. So key pair authentication is something that is available in Snowflake. Uh, and I think it can, can sometimes feel a little intimidating, but it really is not that bad. Um, you create the user just like you would with single sign-on. And important to know is if you do have single sign-on enabled, a user created this way will still be able to log in with single sign-on authentication. That's true of the password user as well. Um, the difference here is that this public key value exists. So this is where you would put in the uh, RSA public key that will be used to authenticate programmatically from your private key. Um, Snowflake is rather particular about how this key is generated and uh, given to Snowflake. So I've written a, a bash script here that allows us to generate it. So uh, we provide a name for the private key here. These are the parameters that I've chosen to use. Uh, they typically work with Snowflake. I tried to use uh, SSH keygen, which I thought would work, but that doesn't work for this. So really stick to open SSL. They have this documented in Snowflake as well. Uh, and then next, go ahead and generate a public key from this. It's important that your private key is encrypted with a password for Snowflake. They, they really like you to do that. So uh, I have that set up here as well. So to run this, I will just run the command. It asks for an encryption password. I will provide one and verify. And then to move to the next phase, I will need to decrypt the private key before a public key can be generated. So I'll provide the password one more time and everything's generated. We can look at those right now. The private key, which um, you know, I'll delete right after this. Also, it's encrypted, so I, without my password, this isn't meaningful to anyone. It looks like this. You should not have to mess with this for creating the user, but this is what you'll use for any sort of programmatic authentication. You'll, you'll point your, uh, your client tool to this as your credential. And then in your public key, it looks like this, kind of a smaller version of the other one. Um, you can't just copy this though and insert it into the, um, the create user field, right? The, the public RSA key field. Uh, for Snowflake, you're gonna wanna cop copy everything here. I don't wanna risk um, modifying this. And uh, in a new, new kind of page here, let's cut out this bottom part, that comment, and let's cut out the top part. And then on uh, every line here, we're gonna to go to the end and just delete the new line. So now what we have is a kind of an uninterrupted string of uh, a public key. And this is the way that Snowflake's gonna to want uh, to, to be given this value. So we go into the public key and you just place that just like you pulled it from here. This is something that's given me uh, pain in the past and maybe there's a way to construct this so that it looks the same, but this is the way I've done it and it works really well for me every time. And uh, I'll copy all of this now, because right now everything here is ready to run. And then in Snowflake, uh, let's set our context to security admin. Uh, and important to note, Snowflake now has the, the new default role, the new role of user admin. That's something that comes out of the box with your Snowflake account. And this role is a child of the security admin and is intended to manage uh, user uh, creation management without necessarily having all the privilege of the security admin. I don't need that level of granularity, so I'm not gonna use the user admin, but you could do this just the same with a user admin. Uh, and let's go ahead and run these commands. Let's create these users. So uh, Peggy Olson is created, and then we could even um, run a describe real quick. And that gives us uh, a lot of information here. We could have provided a comment. I don't typically use those. Uh, but that might be something that you do, like if you're creating a guest account or you have some other special reason to uh, comment this. And there's actually quite a lot of information here. But uh, down here, you'll see there is no RSA public keys uh, to be seen. Next, let's create this single sign-on user. Very simple, uh, works just fine. And then our, um, our key pair user. So again, these key pairs cannot be used to uh, log into the UI. You won't be able to get in here with just that. So you'll need to either provide a password if you don't have single sign-on for this user, which really is just as simple as adding the password field, uh, lining it up maybe too. So that'll create a password and then maybe add the uh, must change password. Uh, that's a good habit to get into so that your users um, 
Don't maintain the password that you already know about. And then the public key is here as well. So that's already created. Let's show that user. And at the bottom, we have the actual RSA, the fingerprint for that value. Uh, so we see that it's set. If I wanted to rotate these keys, if I had some sort of internal policy for that, then what I could do is create a um, another set of key, another key pair, put the public key set to the, the RSA pu public key too. And that really is just as simple as this. Uh, and then once that's set, both your sets of keys will work to authenticate. And then you can um, set this one to none. Uh, you can remove this this value. That way you can rotate without losing access. Uh, you can kind of fold over like that. Thank you for listening to uh, HashMap Megabytes and subscribe for more quick cloud concepts. HashMap Megabytes.